episode 2 of Tintin's Odd Your Adventure series. Welcome to it. My name is Alan, hoping that you are doing well. Whenever you're listening to this, wherever you may be in the world right now. It took me a while, but it's finally done. We're looking at volume 2 in the adventures of Tintin. This is Tintin in the Congo. Again, the reason for the delay was there were two versions of this that I wanted to read the original black and white version and then the redrawn color version from 1946 so I wanted to read both get my notes together so that at least I find out what the differences were what, what changes were done in the color version and put them in my notes that I can at least talk about them for this episode so I'm just going to just give you a little warning right now that if you thought the first book Tintin in the land of the Soviets was crazy this one takes a little goes a little step further so I want to strap in for this one so Tintin in the Congo was serialized in the children's supplement of the 20th century newspaper the little century from the 5th of june 1930 to the 11th of june 1931 and would then be collected as a volume in 1931 by the editions of the little century and then a few months later published by casterman uh, Hergé would redraw Tintin in the Congo in 1946 for Casterman and that's the one which would be in color. The English translation would be done by Leslie Lonsdale Cooper and Michael Turner and it would be 60 years until the English version was published. English version of the original black and white would be published in 1991. This is because or because of the perceived racial content of this book, British publishers were reluctant to publish this book in English. That's why it took such a long time for it to get published in English. And then a Danish media corporation, Egmont, the Egmont Group, they would publish the 1946 edition in English in 2005. Um, so now I just wanted to read the there's a foreword which was done which was left by the English translators. So I wanted to read the last paragraph because it's very key to this book and will touch into what this last paragraph means in the notes section of the episode because it's a reference to an interview that Hergé uh, was willing to do with uh, a French writer we'll get into that. So this is the last paragraph. In his portrayal of the Belgian Congo, the young Hergé reflects the colonial attitudes of the time. He himself admitted that he depicted these Africans according to the bourgeois paternalistic stereotypes of the period. The same may be said of his treatment of big game hunting and his attitude towards animals. So there you have it. Just a little, I guess it, it also can count as, as a warning of uh, just what to expect in this book. So you've been warned. So let's get right into it. It begins with Tintin and Snowy. They're at a train station about to leave for hope I got this right. Antwerp. Is it Antwerp? It's the, the capital of the, the Antwerp province in the Flemish region of Belgium. It's said to be the largest city in Belgium. So if anyone from Belgium is listening, uh, please let me know if I got the name the pronunciation correctly. Antwerp or Antwerp. So they're, they're about to leave for Antwerp where they'll board a ship named the Zetaisville or this will to reach the Congo. This will uh, was the former name of 
place called Banza Ngungu, a city and territorial a territory in the Congo central province of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it was named after a man named Albert Thys or this T H Y S who was a a Belgian businessman. So let's just do a little background about Belgian Belgian Congo. It was a colony of Belgium from 1908 all the way up until 1960 and then in 1964 it would get the name the Democratic Republic of Congo. So at the train station Tintin is addressing a small crowd made up of a few reporters, cameramen and some children. Among those children are two boys uh, named Quick and I don't know if the, the, the P is, is pronounced with silence. It's Quick and Fluke or Fluke. These two boys are the main characters of another comic series that Hergé had started a few months before, which was named Quick and Fluke. It was serialized alongside The Adventures of Tintin and would be active until 1941. I'll put a link, a Wikipedia link, to Quick and Fluke so you can read more about that comic. So while Tintin is addressing that crowd, we see Snowy, he's got his own crowd that he's addressing. Uh, not a crowd of reporters or anything, just a crowd of stray dogs. And he's there telling them that, oh, I'm going to be hunting, I'm going to look for the lion. So he's pretty excited about going on this trip. So they board the train and they then eventually get onto the boat, the porter directs them to their cabin and uh, he shows Tintin and Snowy yeah, their cabin. I just thought it was interesting that their porter just so happens to be a black man for sighting of a black individual in this comic and well it's it's in black and white but in the colored version instead of being you know like brown at least like a combination of brown and black he is completely black, you know, as if he was dipped in crude oil. So I, I just thought, yeah, this already with black people in this in this comic are not going to be portrayed very well. So here we go. So once Tintin has got to his cabin and set his things aside, he decides to go out to have a walk on the deck while Snowy is checking out their luggage. He's got his own mosquito net and he notices that Tintin has also brought a big gun which he'll be using to hunt down elephants. And then suddenly there is a, a shout from outside the cabin. Someone is shouting, all hands on deck, abandon ship. And this alarms Snowy because the, the ship has not even begun sailing yet. But already they're sinking. So he goes to grab a life preserver, but then he realizes so oh, this is not going to help him, and then he rushes out of the cabin, bumping into the source of the voice, which turns out to be a parrot. Now Snow is not too happy about the noise, having realized that all oh, that shouting was coming from a parrot, so he goes back into the cabin, but the parrot, as Snow is leaving, the parrot sees is his little tail and it grabs the tail. So now we see Snowy and the parrot, they start fighting and this noise, it attracts Tintin who comes back when the, the fight is ended. The parrot is now beat up with several feathers missing. Um, Snowy is all uh, bruised up and he notices that uh, his tail he started to swell and he's worrying that maybe he caught uh, what's called Saitaiko try and pronounce this Saitakosis P-A-S-I-T-T-A-C-O-S-I-S -T 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 -S -S. he believes he might have caught that from the parrot 
Now this is a, a type of disease usually passed on to humans from birds. So Tintin he takes Snowy and they head to the to see the ship's doctor. So the doctor tells Tintin that Snowy will need a bit of surgery. So Snowy is on the surgery table while the, the surgeon is the doctor is getting his, his equipment sorted out. So the door to the to the room is open and someone is walking down the passage. Snowy sees them. It's a pass it's a carpenter. And Snowy starts worrying that oh that that man is going to come in and use his, his tools to perform the surgery. So he's now he's now panicking and Tintin has to calm him down. Tell him no that that guy was, was just a carpenter. He's not he's not the doctor he's not going to use his his tools, so don't worry about that. So eventually the doctor gets his things ready, performs the surgery and dear Snowy is back to his happy self. He's just got a bandage wrapped around his tail, but he's okay now. So they leave and Tintin suggests that they they go onto the deck now that the now that the ship has been moving, it's approaching Lisbon. On the way to the deck, Tin, uh, Snowy sees the parrot again, and the bird starts insulting him, calling him a dirty dog. And this leads to Snowy chasing after the parrot onto the deck uh, until it reaches a, a pipe that Snowy he jumps into trying to catch the bird, but he misses the parrot. So he goes into the pipe and he ends up dropping into the cargo hold. And there he finds a stowaway who isn't too happy about someone finding him down here. So he picks up a, a steel bar and chases after Snowy. Yeah, eventually Snowy he finds a portal and he jumps through and he ends up off the ship into the ocean. A Tintin is by is on the deck. He notices that someone has gone overboard. It's Snowy. So he calls for the ship to be to be stopped while he rescues while he rescues Snowy. He grabs a wire rope, throws it down to Snowy to grab Snowy. He grabs hold of the rope, but is attacked by an electric ray, and he's electrocuted. The electric shock runs through that wire rope catches Tintin on the opposite side and he's knocked out for a brief time. One of the sailors, uh, a black man, he tries to help Snowy by throwing out a life preserver ring to Snowy. Unfortunately, the ring bonks <laughs> Snowy on the, on the head and he goes under. While Tintin, he recovers and he asks, oh, what about Snowy? What happened to him? And the sailor has to tell him, oh, Snowy... He went under, unfortunately, and uh, Tintin he now has to go out to to save his friend. And the line that he delivers to the sailor before he jumps off of off the ship, he says, "Oh, and you did nothing to save him. Well, now you'll see what a real man does." And I I just thought this was interesting because the sailor did try to save Snowy just now, even though. Unfortunately, the ring that he threw, he hit Snowy in the head, but at least he tried. But as far as, Snow, as Tintin is concerned, he didn't do anything. So Tintin jumps off the ship into the water with the same sailor warning him that there are sharks in the water, but no, Tintin didn't hear him. So Tintin, he dives underwater, he rescues Snowy, and he's swimming back up to the surface. There's a shark there that sees him. And it grabs hold of, of his, his right foot. Uh, Tintin, he manages to kick off his shoe. And that's what the, the shark grabs hold of. And um, the shark comes back again trying to, to eat him. But Tintin, he finds the life preserver ring, which he feeds to the shark. And that's what the shark is busy trying to to eat while a a lifeboat arrives 
saves Tintin and Snowy. They get back onto the ship, um, and Tintin now has to perform uh, uh, some quick mouth to mouth to save Snowy. And once Snowy is saved and rescued, the two of them they get to the other side of the deck and they, they rest up and recover. And not much else happens on the trip. So the ship passes the Canary Islands and several days later Tintin and Snowy they arrive in the Congo. And Tintin says to Snowy they'll first stop in a place called Bomba before reaching Matadi. Now, excuse me, Bomba is modern day Boma, B O M A, a port town located along the Congo River in the Congo central province of the DRC. Matadi, M A T A T I, is the major seaport of the DRC and is also the capital of the Congo central province. And as the ship is arriving, we see a local man and his son they're watching the ship arrive and he tells his son that oh that ship has got the famous reporter master tintin and his companion snowy and the, the little little boy his son who's named snowball he is holding a copy of the, the little century so queer tintin is already well known to the to the locals and there's a big crowd of native congolese who are there to welcome Tintin and Snowy when they arrive with cheers of long live Tintin, long live Snowy and they are then carried on the people's shoulders like heroes and it's like there's a parade going on to, to welcome these two and they are carried all the way to a nearby hotel where the two rest for the night. It's a peaceful night for, for, for Tintin but for Snowy not so much because Unfortunately for him, Snowy forgot his mosquito net and so he spends the whole night, you know, fighting a losing battle against some mosquitoes and in the morning when Tintin wakes up, he sees Snowy and Snowy is all lumpy and swollen, he's, even his eyes are shut and, uh, you know, Tintin feels sorry for him so he gets some ointment and he's about to you know, treat Snowy, but there's a knock on the door. Tintin goes over to answer the door and he lets in three gentlemen. Each of them is representing a major newspaper that is interested in Tintin's official reports while he's here in the Congo. The first man, the first man is from the New York Evening Post and is offering Tintin a check worth 1,500 US dollars. I tried to find an inflation calculator just to see how much that's worth today's money and found out that it's close to 30,000 US dollars today um, plus a contract for Tintin to sign. The second man represents the London Daily and he offers 250 British pounds sterling, which is close to 20,000 pounds today. Third man represents Lisbon's Diario de Lisboa, and he's willing to pay 20,000 escudos. I couldn't find what, how much that is in today's money. If anyone can find out, you can let me know. 20,000 escudos. So Tintin is thinking over these offers and as he's thinking the, the New York Evening Postman and the London Daily Man they double their offers while the the third man he just comments that yeah this is this is getting too expensive he, he's not going to to double his offer so Tintin he consults Snowy who doesn't accept these offers because to him they're too little and he he comments that uh, the, the, the offers are not worth the reports that Tintin brought back from his previous adventure when he was in, in Russia. So after hearing this, you know, Tintin, he 
turns to three men and he declines the offers. And he says that he's being paid by the, the little century and he's given them his word. So the three men, they, they leave without any, any success. And Tintin has a chance to, to treat Snowy. And once he's healed up, Tintin says, okay, now they'll need a car and someone to be their guide. And their guide ends up being a local boy, excuse me, named Coco. And, you know, Snowy gives this, after Coco agrees to be their guide, so there's a little comment that Snowy gives where he says, oh, this guy, he doesn't look very bright. And I'm just thinking, he doesn't look very bright, and yet this is the, the person they'll be relying on to be their, their guide. So I don't know what what uh, Snowy's comment meant by that. So anyway, they then meet up with a car salesman who says he's got what they need, a, quote, excellent trans-Sahara model vehicle and the vehicle in question looks turns out to be this you know this beat up old vehicle but somehow it's still moving it's still road function functional so that's the car that they get and um, they begin driving eventually they make it to a, to a river they stop there and Tintin, he tells Coco to watch the car while he goes off to search for game. And Snowy he takes this opportunity to go out for a swim, which is a very bad idea because Snowy, once he gets into the water and is showing off his swimming skills, he decides to hold on to a log while waiting for, for Tintin. That log is not a log, but it's a resting crocodile, which wakes up and tries to, to get rid of Snowy. Tintin, who's nearby, he sees what's happening. He gets his rifle, he aims it at the crocodile, he fires one shot, but the bullet just bounces off the crocodile. And this is when the crocodile proceeds to to hit Snowy with its tail, sends Snowy bumping into Tintin. And then now the crocodile starts approaching them, and Snowy he runs off, leaving Tintin behind. Uh, Tintin is now left to deal with the crocodile. He aims his rifle, looking to shoot the crocodile at point blank, but nothing happens because he is now out of cartridges. So what ends up, what Tintin ends up doing is he sticks the, 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 the rifle upright into the gaping mouth of the crocodile. And unfortunately, this creature is left like that with the rifle in its mouth. And Tintin goes off to find Snowy. They, he finds Snowy and then they return to the spot where they parked the car. But there's no car now. There's no Snowy. There's no Coco. And Tintin doesn't believe this. He starts calling for Coco. Where is he? The boy emerges from some bushes and he bursts into tears. Telling Tintin, oh, there's a, a white man who showed up. He beat up Coco and he took the car. So Coco was afraid and he went into hiding. But Tintin, he's, he's not upset. He just takes this calmly. He proposes that they follow the trail of the car, hoping that down the road maybe the car has broken down. So they follow the car's trail. Soon enough, they spot the car ahead. Tintin and Snowy, they then get close enough to see the man who stole it. And that man is the stowaway from the ship. Find out that the car has indeed broken down and the stowaway has been failing to start it up again. Now Tintin is very cautious and he notices that the man is carrying a rifle. So he has to figure out, okay, how am I going to knock him out? There's a coconut nearby. Tintin picks up the coconut and he throws it at the man, but he misses. The man turns around, he sees Tintin, then he aims his, his gun, ready to fire. 
but then suddenly he's showered by several coconuts and this is enough to knock the store away knock, knock him out and Tintin figures out oh, maybe this must have been done by monkeys who might have seen him throwing the coconut so they just copied him so he gets to the man he ties him up and with the plan that they'll drop him off at a nearby police station so they tie the man up then they get to another area where they'll set up their tent for the day so he instructs T uh, Coco to set up their tent meanwhile Tintin he'll go out to search for their supper so we see Snowy and Tintin they're out in the bushes they see an antelope several meters ahead Tintin fires at it but the antelope is still standing unharmed Tintin fires again and he fires again and he fires again until he doesn't see the antelope but he doesn't understand how he could have missed so him and Snowy they reach the spot where the antelope had been standing and discover not one antelope but several antelope they're all dead and well I guess they found their dinner so they get one antelope and they head back to camp on the way back to camp there's a monkey in the tree it notices snowy and it has never seen an animal like this before so that monkey comes down from the tree hurries over to snatch up snowy and hurries back up the tree out of Tintin's reach now Tintin doesn't want to fire his rifle because he is worried he might hit snowy while trying to shoot the monkey so he goes off to find an alternative uh, way to reach the monkey what he does is he finds another monkey right he shoots that other monkey and then he proceeds to skin the monkey and he wears the monkey skin like a costume right? then he goes back to the trees he climbs a tree next to the one which is occupied by the first monkey and the first monkey sees this this new quote unquote monkey and it likes the the hat that this monkey is wearing Tintin is is wearing his safari hat while in this costume so the first monkey is willing to trade snowy for the hat and this is how Tintin is able to rescue snowy and they climb back down the tree and notice that they've been followed by the monkey because now the monkey wants to trade the hat for Tintin's gun but Tintin refuses he takes back his hat from the monkey and then he proceeds to kick the monkey when he tries to grab his gun and this is enough to, to not stop the monkey and he doesn't trouble them any further Tintin and Snowy they make it back to camp and Tintin is he's still wearing the, the monkey skin and once Coco sees him he thinks oh the monkey has, has eaten Tintin and he's all frightened but Tintin he takes off the costume and assures him no it's, it's just a costume it's just me and again there's another little comment from, from Snowy where he's saying he's asking how can you be afraid of, of a monkey you know after seeing Coco react to to, to Tintin in the, in the costume so while they're eating supper Tintin asks about the stowaway their prisoner Coco assures him that oh he's still tied up but if you've got the comic you'll see like the next panel after the one showing Coco saying oh the the, the story is still tied up we see the story making his escape in the dark and in the morning this is when Coco discovers all oh, the prisoners gone but Tintin isn't bothered about that now he says let's just forget about him let's continue with our journey they get back in the car got their things ready they proceed and things are going well until they reach a railway line and this is where the car gets stuck the rear wheels of the car are failing to, to cross over the line 
and now there's a train making its way down the line um, Coco he's now worried oh they're going to get destroyed by this train so he jumps out of the car and the train comes along and it hits the car and guess who wins that fight the car wins because the train topples over and is now on its side the car is still fine um, the passengers exit the train and the commotion starts now with Tintin having to apologize to the crowd there's one woman on the side who's angry because um, a child is injured now when I say injured I don't mean the child has a broken arm or he's bleeding no he's he's got a small bump on his forehead but she's making a big deal of this and he's angry at Tintin so Tintin has to try and calm down the crowd by saying he, has, he and uh, Snowy they'll repair the train but what ends up happening is it's the passengers who end up doing all the work while Tintin and Snowy they're just standing by the side you know supervising the work so the passengers manage to get the train upright again back onto the track but the engine is damaged so what do they do now the train can't move no problem for Tintin what he does is gets back into his car he fastens a rope to the train and he tows the train with his with his car this beat up looking car manages to tow this this big train all the way to the next station and now when they arrive at the next station Tintin is ready to leave but the passengers they they stop him and they tell him that no he, he must come with them these these people they are known as the Baba Orom so they want um, you know they want to take Tintin back with them to their village um, Snowy he suggests okay Tintin accept um, their proposal so they accompany Tintin back to their village at the village Tintin meets with the king the Baba Orom who welcomes him to the village calling him Bola Matari this is a nickname which roughly means breaker of rocks now this nickname was given to a real-life um, explorer from the 19th century maybe you've heard of him uh, Henry Morton Stanley he was famous for finding another uh, explorer who had gone missing David Livingston if you've heard uh, a quote uh, I think the quote went something along the lines of Dr. Livingston I presume it's credited to, to Stanley when he found Livingston in, in Tanzania I believe and uh, this man Stanley he is also famous for claiming the Congo Basin region on behalf of Belgium's King Leopold II in the 19th century and that region would eventually become Belgian Congo um, just a little note about David Livingston for those of you who might not know um, I'm from Zim so if you go to Victoria Falls there's a there's a spot where you can yeah, see the falls um, I think I'm trying to remember now is a it's a rainforest right so when you get to the end of the rainforest and you can see the the big falls there's a statue of David Livingston I'm not sure if it's if it's true but it's said that he might have been the first European to see Victoria Falls so I guess that statue is dedicated dedicated David Livingston so again uh, Tintin is given this nickname Bola Matari break of rocks and he's also called the all-powerful good white man Tintin and uh, the king says he will spend the night here and tomorrow Tintin will go out to hunt for a lion with the villagers sounds good to Tintin In the morning we see Tintin and a group of warriors going out to hunt for a lion and Snowy is there wondering if 
a lion? Is it as big as a rabbit? What does it look like? And eventually they hear the roar of a lion and Tintin and Snowy, they see it and they have to be careful as they approach it. And when Tintin gets close enough to the lion, he's attacked to the point where he's, he's knocked out while Snowy, he runs off in fright. And once uh, you know Tintin is left there unconscious, the lion picks him up and leaves. And Snowy, realizing that oh, the lion might be carrying Tintin back to its den to eat, he decides to take action. And Snowy runs off, runs off to bite the tail of the lion. And the lion has to leave Tintin behind to deal with, with Snowy. But Snowy is holding on to this tail, holding fast, holding tightly to the point where the lion ends up running in another direction and it runs between a couple of trees and Snowy bumps into one of those trees and he lets go of the tail. What, 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 uh, what ends up happening is he bites off the end of the lion's tail. Yeah, the lion's tail. And now uh, on the, somewhere else Tintin has woken up and he finds Snowy has got a part of the lion's tail and they go off to rejoin uh, the, the, the other hunters who have found the, the injured lion now. It's there sitting roaring in pain and the hunters think okay this is an opportunity to attack the lion but the lion is still angry enough to to, to chase off to chase off the hunters the hunters and one of those hunters he sees Tintin arrive and says you might as well come quick because the lion doesn't have a tail and once Tintin and Snowy arrive the lion sees Snowy with part of its tail and it's you know, cowering in fright with uh, Tint, you know, Snowy I should say he starts scolding the lion threatening to bite off the rest of its tail if it, if it doesn't behave so Tintin is able to, I think, tie a leash or a rope around one of the, the lion's legs and he leads it back to, to the village, wondering if maybe he can tame this lion. Now, back at the village, one person who is not too happy about uh, Tintin being here is the village witch doctor, a man named Muganga. And he thinks Tintin is becoming too popular and if this continues they might not require a witch doctor anymore. And while Muganga is, you know, frustrated about Tintin, the stowaway appears and he assures uh, the witch doctor not to worry about Tintin. He's got an idea. So the next morning, one of the villagers finds the witch doctor and says that the the tribe's sacred idol has been stolen. So the witch doctor, he sets up a fire so that he can consult the great spirit. And after consulting, quote unquote, he declares that according to the great spirit, the sacred idol has been stolen by Tintin. And Tintin, he denies stealing it and he even suggests that we can look into his hut where you are staying can check. They go in, they search the hut, and not only do they find the sacred idol, but there's an axe that has been embedded into the idol's head. And that's enough evidence for the villagers. And they capture Tintin and Snowy, they tie them up, and they leave him in one of the houses where the witch doctor tells Tintin that in the morning they will be put to death. So at some point at night that day, a savior appears to rescue Tintin and Snowy, that savior being their guide, Coco. He unties Tintin and Snowy, and they make their way through the village. Everyone else is asleep except for one house with the light is still on. That house belongs to the witch doctor. And Tintin gets to one of the windows of the house he overhears a conversation going on between the witch doctor and the story and this is where he learned that the two of them worked together to 
to stitch up Tintin. So Tintin hurries back to his hut and he comes back with a camera and a phonograph and he sets this equipment up by the window of Muganga's hut and he records their conversation where you know the witch doctor also reveals that he's deliberately keeping the villagers ignorant and calling them stupid and little does he know that all of what he's saying is being recorded and in the morning the witch doctor goes back to the hut where Tintin and Snowy had been tied up but he finds that the hut is empty now then he goes out and he finds Tintin and Snowy walking about the village and Tintin has got his equipment with him um, the witch doctor tries to confront Tintin but Tintin just pushes him aside he sets up the, the phonograph he plays the recorder and the villagers, to their surprise, they hear the voice of the witch doctor coming from the phonograph. Yeah, obviously, they've never seen this uh, machine before. So you have this moment where they think the witch doctor is in the machine. You know, I guess. Um, and then afterwards, Tintin then shows the villagers into another hut where the, the camera and the projector they've all been set up and this is where the villagers they see footage of the witch doctor in the storeway making their plans and plotting and this is enough for the villagers to chase away the witch doctor and the storeway out of the village and the people are grateful to Tintin calling him the good white man and they recognize him as their chief and so now Tintin and Snowy taking a walk through their quote-unquote village and they come across two men who are fighting and Tintin he breaks up the fight asks them why are they fighting and one man says the, the other man stole his straw hat or the second man points to the first one and calls him a thief so what we get here is a, a scene where Tintin uh, according to Snowy exercises his judgment of Solomon what Tintin does, he takes the hat and he cuts it in two. He presents the brim of the hat to the first man. Then the top of the hat is presented to the second man. And problem solved. Each man has a part of the hat and they are happy with that. No problem, no questions asked. And they go on their way thanking quote unquote white master Tintin. And then next scene we see Tintin and Snowy they enter a hut where there's a woman who's crying because her husband yeah, she believes her husband is dying and Tintin he checks on the man and he says oh, it's nothing serious he's not dying he just has a fever and he gives this man a dose of a medicine known as quinine Q -R -Q -U -I -N -I. Q-U-I-N-I E. This is a medication which is used to treat malaria. So right after receiving this medication, the man sits up immediately and is cured. And next thing you know, he's leaving the hut to go out hunting. And his wife can't thank Tintin enough, saying, White man, very good, big master. Him cure my husband. White master is Gola Matari. So we went from Tintin solving a dispute to curing a man of malaria, apparently. So elsewhere, we see the story and the witch doctor plotting their next move. They travel to the village of the Mahatavu, an enemy tribe to the Babarong. And there they see the king is lounging outside and uh, the witch doctor, he's got a bow and arrow. He fires the arrow and it hits a tree near where the king is sitting, startling him. And on the arrow is a piece of paper with a message attached to the arrow, which the king reads, which says, The Matawu are chicken hearts. The Baba Rom declare war upon them. The great white 
the great white chief of the Baba Rome will lead them to victory. And so upon hear, reading this, the king is furious and he assembles his army. And we get a look at his army, which, as he's pointing it out, he claims that it's trained and equipped like a European army. Uh, and yet these, these soldiers are armed with spears, a shield, bows and arrows, and I'm thinking, which European army looks like that? You know, it was just very ridiculous seeing these guys. So we switch back to the Babarum village where one of the villagers hurries over to Tintin to inform him that the Mahatavu army is coming. And upon hearing this, Tintin, he's not worried, he's not panicking. He just says you'll go out to deal with them alone. And you'd think this is strange because there's a group of warriors who are ready to accompany Tintin to face the army, but Tintin would rather deal with his army on his own and all he has is his rifle a bag of ammunition and snowy so they leave the village they get to a spot and they look around but there's no sign of the army but the army is there they're just hiding in the bushes so once they see Tintin they fire their arrows at him but for some unknown reason the arrows fail to hit him and instead they hit the tree that Tintin is standing next to. The king doesn't understand. Why are they missing the target? Could this be Juju maybe? So he orders for heavy artillery, which is in the form of a mounted gun, which they treat like a cannon. So they, they light up the rifle and it backfires in front of the soldiers who are operating the, the mounted gun, quote unquote. The king is now frustrated now. He tries to to um, kill Tintin with his Asagai. And Asagai is a it's a long slender spear. But the king misses Tintin. And at this point the Matavu, the Mahatavu, they, they surrender to Tintin, they're on their hands and knees. And they're there acknowledging him as their new chief. And Tintin is just standing there acting like a big shot, you know, telling them not to mess with him again. So afterwards, Tintin and Snowy, they return to the village. And on the way, Tintin reveals that he had placed a powerful electromagnet behind the tree, which is what attracted the tips of the of the arrows, the Asagai. There was no, no juju involved. And the, then we see the stowaway and the witch doctor there in a hiding spot and they're seeing the Matavu army heading back home. And they're all smiles, they're singing a song about how brave they are and about their king, the white man who was untouched by arrows. But for the stowaway and the witch doctor, back to square one now. So we head back to the Babarum village. We see Tintin. He is cleaning his rifle in preparation for another hunt, which he tells Snowy will be for a leopard. They'll be hunting for a leopard later in the evening. Snowy has made it back to that village and he overhears Tintin tell Snowy what the next plan is. So afterwards, the story exits the village, goes to meet Muganga, the witch doctor, somewhere else, and he tells the witch doctor what Tintin is, is planning to, to, to do next. And for the witch doctor, this is good news, because he's got a plan which he believes will work this time. He then tells the story about a secret society known as the Aniota, whose aim is to stop the advancement of civilization here in the Congo. They also target natives who support, um, I guess it should be colonization, and they do this while wearing special leopard skin costumes. And what they do is they got these uh, sticks 
on one end of the stick it's carved to look like a leopard's paw and upon killing these people they mark the ground to make it look like a leopard killed these people so the witch doctor just so happens to have one of these uh, leopard skin costumes he puts it on and he shows the story who is visibly terrified by this by this costume and as a bit of trivia the Aniota it's actually based on a real uh, society of these uh, leopard leopard skin wearing men I'll put a link in the description um, if you want to just get a basic idea of what this society was at night Tintin and Snowy they're out in the wild eventually they make it to a pool where Tintin expects uh, a leopard to appear to drink but they wait quite a long time to, um, it's like midnight while they're waiting and as they're waiting the witch doctor in full costume he sneaks up behind them and just as he's about to attack Tintin he is attacked by a boar constrictor and he starts calling for help and Tintin turns around he sees the witch doctor is in trouble he kills the boar constrictor and rescues the witch doctor. He unmasks him, um, really finding out that oh, it's the witch doctor. And at this point, uh, Munkanga he, he surrenders to Tintin, and he tells him what he was planning to do. And then Tintin asks him where his partner in crime is. The story, and the witch doctor tells Tintin that. The stowaway is waiting for him under a baobab tree at the edge of the forest. Tintin and Snowy, they make it to the tree, but they don't see the stowaway. The stowaway is there. He's lying on a branch above them. And he's got a, a wooden club with him, which he uses to knock out Tintin. And then he knocks out Snowy. And after that, he, he ties up Tintin. He ties up Snowy, but he leaves Snowy behind. He is going to come back for Snowy. He is more focused on Tintin. So he picks up Tintin and carries him all the way to a river. When Tintin wakes up, it's, it's the next day now. And unfortunately for him, he is tied to a tree by the story. And the story tells Tintin that the tide of the river rises every hour and at some point it will be high enough for the crocodiles in the river to reach Tintin as he's hanging from this tree and then the stowaway leaves Tintin there and Tintin at this point he is he's thinking yeah this is the end for him now because he can see the tide is rising the crocodiles are there waiting to jump on him but suddenly the crocodiles are dropping dead in the water. Uh, shots are being fired. Tintin he sees a canoe making its way to him. In this canoe is a priest and he recognizes Tintin and he unties him from the tree. Uh, Tintin he thanks the priest but he wants to check on Snowy so he hurries back to where Snowy was left. Then we see Snowy he is wide awake now but He's tied to a, a wooden stake in the ground. He can't, he can't escape. And unfortunately for him, another boa constrictor has appeared. And Snowy, he can't fight this giant snake and ends up getting eaten by the boa constrictor. By the time Tintin makes it back to where Snowy was, Snowy is halfway through the stomach of the snake. But he's causing such a fuss for the snake that that's giving the, the boa constrictor a lot of pain. Tintin, he has a pocket knife, he opens up the snake to free Snowy. And this happens while the snake is still very much alive, despite having an opening. And he tries to attack Tintin, but what Tintin does, he grabs the snake's tail and he feeds it to the boa constrictor. So the snake is just left there, eating its own tail. 
and then Tintin and Snowy they make it back to the river they get into the canoe with the, with the priest and they are transported to his mission so the mission it's a fine looking place the priest is there showing him that there's a hospital there's a, there's a, there's a school there's a chapel it took them a year to get all of these uh, uh, places set up but the work has been done and the place looks looks really well and then a student shows up he tells the priest that their teacher father Sebastian is ill so there's no one who can conduct their geography lesson the priest unfortunately he can't conduct the lesson because he's got to visit the, the hospital to conduct his, his, his usual rounds but Tintin is there he volunteers to to conduct the geography lesson so the priest accompanies Tintin to the classroom there the, the children they see Tintin they recognize Tintin and lucky for him it's not a, a rowdy class so he's able to get to the front and then he tells the class oh now that I'm here I'm going to tell you about your country of Belgium I thought this was this was very interesting that it's a geography lesson but it's going to be about the the country that the Congo is a colony of their country of Belgium but before Tintin can get his his, his lesson started a leopard enters the room and the children are hiding behind their desks in fright Tintin has to figure out a way to to deal with the leopard there's a bucket of water by the blackboard in the bucket is a sponge Tintin takes the sponge he throws it at the leopard which eats the sponge and then Tintin uh, empties the bucket which, which is full of water he empties the water all over the classroom floor the leopard drinks the water and wouldn't you know it the sponge in its stomach absorbs all that water that has been drunk and the sponge expands so now the leopard has a terrible stomach ache and it cannot fight Tintin as he's kicking it out of the, the classroom problem solved so now we can carry on with the lesson but he stopped by a new arrival this time it's an angry black man who claims that he's the owner of the leopard which was a tame animal this black man identifies himself as Jimmy Macduff manager of the great American circus so rather than apologizing to Jimmy Tintin goes up to him and tells him uh, the cure for this for the, for the, for the leopard stomachache let me just find the actual quote to you it's much better than, than a summary so he says to the man right my friend the cure is quite simple your leopard has swallowed a sponge now get him to eat a blackboard from force of habit the sponge will start rubbing eventually the sponge will wear out and your leopard will be cured okay now about turn and leave us in peace and you know Jimmy just, just looks at him he's, he doesn't get this and he can't really blame him because that so-called cure how is it going to work you know, he, the leopard has to eat an entire blackboard just so the sponge can rub against it and 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 wear out pretty ridiculous but that's dr tintin for you so jimmy leaves and for the third time tintin tries to start the lesson but this time the priest shows up to interrupt him and thanks him for the lesson which is funny because Tintin has been trying to start the lesson this whole time so the priest then says Tintin should rest because uh, tomorrow they will be going elephant hunting so we move to the next day we see the priest Tintin Snowy and a man who is the tracker for this expedition uh, the priest is not going with them he just uh, like took them halfway he's going to leave them there 
and he says the tracker will lead them to the elephant. They find the elephant's trail and they follow it, eventually finding the elephant. But Tintin's got his, rival, his rifle, he fires at the elephant, he manages to wound it, but he angers the elephant at the same time and he chases after Tintin and Snowy. Tintin heads up a tree, the elephant gets to the tree and tries to uproot the tree. Uh, Tintin has to come up with a plan. Uh, he searches his pockets and he finds a magnifying glass. And since it's during the day, the sun is out, Tintin, um, he, using the, the magnifying glass, he burns a spot on top of the, on the elephant's head. And this scares off the, the poor animal. Tintin gets down from the tree, he tries to fire at the, at the elephant again. And now he and Snowy will have to pursue it. And they can see their spots of blood that have been left on the ground. But the day uh, progresses and there's no luck in catching up with Elephant. And at this point Tintin cannot find the track which would take him back to the mission. Uh, it's dark now so he decides to spend the night out here. Although Snow is not too happy about that because you know there are wild animals around them. So spending the night out here he is not up for that but he eventually joins Tintin in resting. So while they are asleep, a monkey appears, finds them, sees the, the rifle, picks it up, examines the weapon, and then accidentally fires the rifle into some bushes and hits the elephant square in the face. This noise wakes up Tintin and Snowy. Tintin switches on his torch, he sees the monkey, which runs off once it's been spotted. He finds his rifle picks it up and he hears the sound of the injured elephant in the bushes. By the time he gets to the elephant, unfortunately, the elephant is dead now. And that's, that's the end of that. At dawn, you see Tintin and Snowy, they're heading back to the mission. And Tintin has bagged himself pair of elephant tusks and he's looking forward to telling people how he killed an elephant though he didn't kill the elephant it was a monkey that did it although by accident so while Tintin and Snowy are making their way back to the mission the stowaway has got back to the mission first and he finds one of the huts he goes in and there the, he finds the clothes of a priest and he puts them on as a disguise then he heads out to meet Tintin halfway to the mission Tintin doesn't see through the disguise but Snowy is very cautious about this man he doesn't trust the priest so called priest I should say and the stowaway says he'll show them a shortcut back to the mission and he offers to carry Tintin's rifle since he's also carrying the elephant tusks. Tintin gives him the rifle and then the stowaway turns the gun on Tintin. But Tintin manages to trick the stowaway into looking around and then knocks him out. So while the stowaway is knocked out, Tintin decides to search his clothes, hoping to find, find out who he is and what he's up to. Uh, he finds a letter which is titled Instructions Concerning the Reporter Tintin and begins to read it, not seeing the stowaway behind him waking up, picking up a rock and then he hits Tintin in the back of the head, knocking him out. Snowy, he's scared off, he runs away and the stowaway ties up Tintin takes him to a fast-moving river, places him in a canoe, and Tintin is left in that canoe as it's sailing, moving down the river, heading for a waterfall. Tintin wakes up just in time to see the waterfall, and at this point he realizes there's nobody there to save him 
he is surely going to die. The canoe goes over the waterfall and Tintin, he gets caught by a tree branch. And he's left hanging there but he can feel that his weight is loosening the branch. So for a short while he's stuck there but at least he didn't go over the waterfall, to the, uh, the bottom of the waterfall. We see Snowy has run back to the mission. He finds the priest and the priest notices that only Snowy is here, which could mean something has happened to Tintin. So he gathers some ropes, he follows Snowy to the river, then they make it to the waterfall where they see Tintin. You know what the, the priest does? He fixes uh, one end of both the ropes to a tree and then the other end of the ropes to a rock which he throws across the river to, to the opposite bank and then he uses the ropes to make his way across the river to where Tintin is hanging meanwhile on the other side of the river the stowaway can see what's happening and is looking to cut to cut the rope Snowy sees the, the, the stowaway and he hurries back up the river, crosses the river and then he lets the, the current carry him down until he can reach a high point on the other side. Once there, he surprises the stowaway, chases him off. Meanwhile, Tintin is rescued by, by the priest and then he crosses over to where Snowy is and then together they chase after the stowaway. The stowaway can see Tintin and Snowy coming. He fires the rifle at them, but he misses. Uh, Tintin succeeds in getting close to him because the stowaway has run out of cartridges, so he can't fire again. The two men, they start fighting. While they're fighting, Snowy sneaks up behind the stowaway and takes the letter is in his back pocket but he is not able to stop the two men from fighting all the way over a cliff and as they are falling Tintin sees this they, they, he thinks that they're gonna bash into some rocks at the bottom but what he ends up landing on the back of a hippo but the stowaway he falls into the water at the bottom of the cliff and unfortunately there are crocodiles in there and they put an end to the stowaway. So Tintin, he gets off the back of the hippo, he's on the, the cliff wall, but he hears barking from the top. Something is happening to Snowy. So Tintin makes his way back to the top of the cliff. He gets there, but Snowy is not there. What he finds instead are paw prints on the ground, as well as footprints. So he follows the footprints, they lead him into a forest, and up ahead he sees a native warrior. He goes to the warrior, he asks him if he's seen Snowy. And this warrior turns out to be a, a pygmy warrior who is startled by, by, by Tintin and he runs off into the forest. Tintin tries to chase after the man but loses track of him. And then he starts hearing the sound of drums, tom tom drums. And Tintin assumes that warrior might have gone back to his village to sound the alarm. And then he sees more pygmy warriors are making their way through the forest. They're coming towards him. And at first Tintin thinks of running away. Then he changes his mind and decides to confront this group of warriors. But to his surprise, the warriors, they stop, they greet Tintin and they take him to their village. At the village, Tintin is reunited with Snowy, who is being, being treated like royalty, special guest, and the warriors tell Tintin that they found Snowy by the river, and they brought him back to the village. He's safe and sound, he's unharmed, and Snowy gives Tintin the letter that he got from the story. And this is what the letter says. Instructions concerning the reporter Tintin. 1. Get rid of the reporter Tintin by any means, making it appear an accident. 2. Whether you succeed or not, rendezvous on 31st March at 
Calabello under the great lone palm tree at noon. 3. For the instructions will be given to you there. And it's signed by the initials AC. Tintin does not recognize these initials. He wonders who AC is and why does AC want Tintin dead. But reading this letter has given Tintin an idea. So we move to the appointed date, it's the 31st of March, it's the appointed time, it's noon, we're at Calabello, Tintin, Snowy arrive, they're in disguise. They arrive at the palm tree where they meet a man named Kibbons, who thinks Tintin is the stowaway. You are given the name of the stowaway, his name was Tom, and quote unquote Tom tells Gibbons that Tintin is dead. And Kibbons is pleased. He tells Tom that his boss will not forget this. And now there are no obstacles in the way of his plan to control the production of diamonds in the Belgian Congo. So Gibbons, he, he just casually asks Tintin, not knowing that he's in disguise, how did Tintin die? How did you get rid of him? And he, as, as he asks that question, he's, he's turned around to light a pipe. And Tintin is behind him and he's saying, oh, let me, let me demonstrate. By demonstrating, he takes Kibbon's rifle, which is leaning on the palm tree, and he hits Kibbon's over the head with it, knocking him out. By the time Kibbon's wakes up, he's been tied to the palm tree, Tintin has removed the disguise, shocking Gibbons because he thought Tintin was dead. So now Gibbons has to spill the beans as Tintin interrogates him. Gibbons reveals that AC is none other than Al Capone. In the English version of the comic, his name was changed to Al Capone, but we'll stick with his OG name. So Al Capone, the Chicago gangster, he heard about Tintin while he was while he was in, in Russia. And he thought that Tintin has come to the Belgian Congo to screw up his diamond production plans. So he had Tom, the story, follow Tintin with the aim of dealing with him. So Tintin then asks Gibbons where his accomplices his accomplices are. And he's told that they are meeting three of Al Capone's lieutenants in the last house of the village this evening. So afterwards, Tintin unties Gibbons from the tree and he marches him to a nearby police station. And while Gibbons is sent to a cell, Tintin has a chat with the police chief and he tells him what Gibbons told him. So that evening, Tintin and a group of policemen they raid the house where the meeting is in progress. And we fast forward to a week later where we see the headlines of various newspapers um, with a scoop about the reporter Tintin having stopped this gangster operation. And we see Tintin and Snowy, they are at a palace at an unknown location. That's where they've, they've spent this week. But now, it's time to go. So the next day, Tintin and Snowy are leaving. Um, they are being transported by, by four natives. All of a sudden, the natives, they drop the, 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 the transport that they're carrying Tintin in. They run off. And Tintin looks out and he sees that a leopard show has, has arrived. At first, he thinks, oh, it's another another friendly leopard so he tries to be friendly with it uh, while searching for his gun but the leopard is not tame it's not friendly and Tintin fails to find the gun instead he gets a bottle of soda water and he sprays it in the face of the leopard which only makes it angrier and now Tintin tries again to search for the gun he doesn't find the gun instead he finds a mirror and he holds it up in front of the leopard and the leopard sees its reflection in the mirror and it runs away, uh, horrified by what it sees. So, yeah, 
No, no gun needed. Then we come to the point where Tintin and Snowy, they find a wide variety of animals while they're out in the wild. So first, uh, Tintin and Snowy, they spot a pair of giraffes. And Tintin, he has an idea of filming the giraffes. But the giraffes are not too happy about being filmed. They see Tintin and then they run off. Uh, then Tintin has to chase after the giraffes, try filming again. They see him and they, they move away. So this leads to Tintin having to make a giraffe costume for himself. Then he approaches the giraffes and while they are, you know, looking at the so-called giraffe, Tintin is able to film the giraffes and he gets his, his footage. Once he's got enough, he carries on to another area where he finds a rhinoceros. But he won't be filming the rhinoceros, instead he wants to shoot the animal. So he's got his rifle, he fires a couple of bullets but they cannot penetrate the rhino's hide. So Tintin tries plan B. He climbs a tree above where the, the rhino is standing. And then while leaning on a branch, Tintin uses a drill to bore a hole through the hide of the, the rhino. And then he sticks a dynamite, a, a stick of dynamite in this hole. And it's not a small piece of dynamite, mind you. Then he gets to a safe distance, he lights the fuse and bang. He goes back to where the rhino was and there's nothing left of the rhino except except bits and pieces. The tree that he had climbed is gone, there's a stump now. And this part ends with this this quote from Tintin where he says, I think the charge was a bit too strong. You don't say. So from the unfortunate rhino, we get to a wide grass, uh, wide grassland, occupied by what Snowy thinks is a herd of cows. But they're not cows; they are wild buffaloes. And unknowing, Snowy approaches one of them, trying to be friendly, thinking, "Oh, it's a cow," and ends up being chased by this buffalo. The buffalo sees Tintin goes after him next but lucky for Tintin he's standing under a tree and the buffalo rams into the tree while Tintin jumps into one of the branches but that branch snaps Tintin lands on the back of the buffalo and we have a situation where the buffalo is trying to shake him off eventually throwing him off and he lands in a pond nearby but Tintin is not discouraged he's going to try again with that buffalo so he leaves the pond and he goes on to find two rubber trees nearby. I think this was this was just Hergé uh, improvising just for, for this part because rubber trees are not native to the Congo. So just for this part, okay, let's just have two rubber trees. So Tintin makes openings in the box of both trees and he lets the, the rubber sap flow out. So the two streams of rubber sap, they meet in the middle of these two trees and then they are left to dry. And this becomes a long rubber band that extends from, from, from the trees. It becomes a makeshift catapult. And um, Tintin picks up a small stone, he throws it at the buffalo to get its attention. And as the buffalo is charging towards him, Tintin gets a bigger rock, puts it in the catapult, fires the catapult, and the stone smacks the buffalo square in the head, knocks it out, or kills it. It's, 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 it's not clear, but either way, the buffalo's down, and this allows Snowy to get on top of it and pose as Snowy takes his uh, Tintin, gets his camera, and he films Snowy on top of the buffalo. But this doesn't go down very well for the rest of the herd. And they come charging down after Tintin and, and Snowy. So as they are running, Tintin can hear 
there's a tray, there's a, a plane above head and we see on the plane one of the pilots spots Tintin being chased by this herd of buffaloes and he lowers a, a rope ladder for Tintin to grab. Tintin manages to grab the ladder but he's without Snowy because Snowy he ran into a burrow. So once Tintin is in the plane now he tells the pilot my, my dog is still down there we have to land. The pilot tells him uh, no, no, there's, there's not a chance of doing that. But then he recognizes Tintin when he heard the name of his dog Snowy. So the plane is turned is turned around. Actually I should say before the the plane is turned around, the pilot tells Tintin that there had been no news about him for a month. They have been searching for Tintin in order to take him back to Belgium. So after this the plane is turned around, it lands. Tintin and that pilot, they go out to search for Snowy. They are lucky enough to be near the burrow where Snowy ran into and he just comes out once he hears Tintin's voice. And then they make it back to the plane with the co-pilot telling Tintin that they must be an important job for him. That's why they were sent to get him, to bring him back to Belgium. So they get in the plane and it flies out of Belgian Congo and we are told that the news of Tintin's departure has made its way around the African continent and we're shown a number of natives who are saddened by this news there's a, a child crying because Snowy is gone and then the last scene of the story shows a village where several things are going on. You see a person who is bowing to statues of Tintin and Snowy. Um, outside the cafe uh, we see one man who says, they say, in Belgium, all whites like Tintin. Now when I read that, I'm not sure if you are saying in Belgium all whites are like Tintin or all whites like Tintin they think is admirable and so on so yeah it was a, it was a bit vague then we see there's a mother warning her child that if he doesn't behave he'll never be like Tintin there are two dogs there one of them is praising Snowy there's an old man uh, sitting with a group around him saying me never before see Baula Matari all powerful like Tintin and then in the middle of the village we see um, one villager has found Tintin's projector and another villager says to him that if Tintin isn't back in one year and a day the villager can, can keep the projector and that is how Tintin in the Congo comes to an end. Yeah, it is a, a, a big book um, so if you're going to take the time to, to read it, yeah, you might want to give yourself maybe an hour or two to, to read it. But there you have it. That was book two. So now let's get into the notes section of this book. So at the beginning, I had mentioned that Jay had redrawn the, the book for Casterman in 1946. That version was in color and a number of changes were done to that version. So I'm just going to cover some of the, the more interesting changes that were done in the color version. So at the train station, uh, among the crowd that was seeing Tintin off, there were cartoon versions of Roger and his friend, a man named Edgar P. Jacobs. That was a, a pen name actually. He was a, another Belgian comic creator. He is known for the comic Blake and Mortimer. Maybe maybe you've heard of it. It's still going on to this day. And uh, Edgar would help with some of the Tintin volumes, the early ones. He was involved in coloring them. And he contributed 
um, with the artwork and the story for Seven Crystal Balls and Prisoners of the Sun, uh, two other volumes of Tintin. Also in the crowd, um, as I had mentioned, I think I must have mentioned earlier, there was Quick and Fluke, the two boys who were main characters of another comic that Hergé had started around that time. The name of the ship that Tintin and Snowy board is not named in the color version. We got the name in the black and white version, the Thysville, or Thysville. And while Tintin and Snowy are being carried to the hotel by the crowd when they arrive, we see Tom, the stowaway, he's watching from a corner, and this is where he says he'll get them in time. The three gentlemen who were representing those major publications, only the one from the New York Evening Post doubles his offer to 3,000 US dollars. The other representatives, they don't say anything before Tintin consults Snowy and then turns down the offers. Also, Snowy didn't bring up the, the time that Tintin was in, was in Russia, like he did in the black and white version. At the Babarum village, when the villagers are watching the, the film footage of Uganga and Tom the Storway, in the color version there's an extra panel which shows Tom holding the, the sacred statue. And this is what leads to them chasing Tom and the witch doctor out of the village. As for the geography lesson, in the color version, Tintin instead gives them a mathematics lesson. I guess uh, around by that time, you know, mid 40s, the idea of propping up one of Belgium's colonies wasn't such a good idea. So I guess Roger decided to change that to mathematics. Jimmy Macduff, the manager of the Great American Circus, this time he's a white man and the advice that Tintin gives to him for the leopard was changed as well to something more practical. He says this, don't worry, you'll quickly recover. Put him, in a, put him on a diet for a little while and above all, don't give him anything to drink. You wonder why didn't he give the same advice to black Jimmy Macduff? Very strange. The incident with the elephant in the color version happens during the day, while in the black and white version it happened during a part of the day, went into the night and then and then we saw Tintin and Snowy making their way back to the, to the mission the next day. Then the infamous scene with the rhinoceros. Now the page showing that scene was redrawn by Hergé for a 1975 edition of the comic. This was by request from his Scandinavian publisher. So in the redrawn scene, Tintin and Snowy find a tree where they decide to, to rest. Uh, Tintin places his rifle on one of the branches of the tree and while he and Snowy are sleeping the rhino comes starts grazing by the tree and it's startled by Tintin snoring and accidentally hooks the rifle in between its horns so the rhino is trying to shake off the rifle it succeeds in doing that I mean, while it was trying to shake off the rifle, this wakes up Tintin and Snowy. So the rhino succeeds in getting rid of the rifle. It falls on the ground and fires. And this is what scares off the rhino. And that's how the scene ends. So I guess people would have preferred that scene over what we got in the, in the black and white version. So overall, overall thoughts that I have for this, for this volume. I would say in terms of the artwork, it's slightly better than Tintin in the Land of the Soviets. But when it comes to story, up until the discovery of the letter and 
hearing about Al Capone and the diamond production plan, it was pretty much just like land of the Soviets where Tintin was just going from one scene to another. And even Hergé has admitted that from week to week you just try and figure out how to, what to do for Tintin, what um, scenario would he get up to in the next week. So that's that that's that's the thing with, with this book but as a book worth would i recommend it as uh, something interesting to read no but i would recommend reading just at least to see why this book was so so infamous i don't think jay was a racist at all if anything he was merely portraying beliefs and assumptions of the time and he's even brought this up in an in, in interview that he conducted in the 70s with a man named let me get his name right here Numa Sado I'll put a wiki link about him in the description so you can read more about him this interview with Hergé actually made him made him famous so these inter the, the interviews were actually multiple interviews. They were recorded and they were released as a book which was titled Tintin and I Interviews with Hergé, released in 1975. And it would be used as the basis for a documentary in 2005 called Tintin and I. I'm um, hoping maybe if I can find it, I'd like to watch that. Maybe you can watch it as well. But um, like I was saying, Tin, I don't believe Roche was, was a racist. And so the idea of people wanting to get this book banned because of what they perceived to be racist content, I, I think it, it, it was unnecessary because, if anything, it would have just made people more interested in reading the book in the first place. So... So... There was no need to ban it. Funny thing is, the book was a success. Sold really well at the time. And just like with Tintin in the land of the Soviets, there was a, a publicity stunt which was organized by Hergé's boss, uh, Abbe Norbert Walsh, who ran the newspaper, which had the children's supplement that serialized Adventures of Tintin. So for this public stunt, they had an actor dressed up like Tintin, and he was accompanied by by ten African African men. They appeared in Brussels. They appeared in in Liege, and yeah, this just added to make the book more uh, more popular. It's only many years later. Like after many African countries gained their independence, that the attitude towards the book changed because people thought that all oh, this book was promoting um, was pro Belgian Belgian the colonization of the Congo. So that's why it it just gained this negative um, reputation over the years. But funny enough, the book was popular in. French-speaking countries like the DRC. It's in countries like America, Britain, where there have been attempts, and Belgium too, where there have been attempts to ban the book. But from what, I, from what I've read, the attempts have failed. And the book should be available in those countries too. So as far as research for the book is concerned, just like with land of the Soviets, Hergé had limited uh, resources, material, materials for his research. He relied on accounts of missionaries. He had colleagues who would have traveled to the Congo, so they brought back stories about this place. And he was lucky enough to visit the Colonial Museum of uh, uh, Tovaren, it's a municipality 
in the province of Flemish Brabant in Flanders, Belgium. There where he saw the leopard skin costumes on display. Um, but otherwise he didn't go to the Congo personally from what I've read and I think it would have helped if he had actually gone there at least maybe would have gotten a much better story but when all that he was relying on was what people's on people's people's accounts with their own points of view and beliefs well this is the story that we got instead and again he wanted to do that story of Tintin going to America but his boss just like with land of the Soviets wanted him to go elsewhere this time being Congo but now that he got this story out of the way the next volume that we'll be looking at Hergé finally gets to tell his story of Tintin in America so that will be the next episode if you have a copy of Tintin in America where you can borrow it from someone or if it's unavailable in, in your part of the world in the description there will be a link to an online version that you can read I'd say you can start reading it now and let me know what you think of it was it one of your favorite Tintin books if it was does it still hold up after all these years or do you not look at it the same way now so in the description there is an email address where you can send in all your feedback um, if you want to support the series there are links for support as well um, yeah I guess this is the best way to, to put an end to, to, to this book I'm actually glad that we decided to start with book one and book two rather than skip them and just go straight to book three because I think it was important to see how Hergé started rather than going the easy way of just going for when Hergé had developed his signature artwork style and his structuring of plots had started to improve so I'm glad that we started with the first books because now we can because now we can look forward to book three and things should be getting better from from now going forward because his art style has improved the stories are going to start getting more compelling so look forward to that anyway thanks for listening to this episode until next time Take care.